Welcome to Cross Border Interviews. Today, we are honored to be sitting down and speaking with Caslow Mayor Suzanne Hewitt. You'll be delighted by this quaint mountain village right on the shores of the Kootenai Lake. Nestled in a lush valley and surrounded by the Selkirk and Purcell Mountains, this charming community is home to roughly 1,000 residents. Caslow may be small, but it is sure mighty. With heritage buildings lining the main downtown thoroughfare, boutique accommodations, pristine beaches, and exceptional adventures all within walking distance. Discover the world's oldest intact stern wheeler. Browse boutique shops with local artisan goods, sample craft beers, and eat at delicious eateries. Paddle Kootenai Lake, e-bike up to the forest, catch some museum culture, go to special events and festivals, chase waterfalls, or summit peaks. Caslow is full of adventure waiting to be found. So we'll be right back after a quick message with cross-border interviews featuring Caslow Mayor Suzanne Hewitt. Are you looking for a team of experienced professionals to help develop a strategic plan for your municipality? Look no further. At Strategic Steps, their team of experts has years of experience working in municipal administration. They take a comprehensive approach to planning, carefully listening to your community's needs, and working closely with your council to develop a homegrown strategy tailored to your unique community. Contact Strategic Steps today to learn more about how they can help you create a brighter future for your community. Call Strategic Steps at 780-416-9255 or visit strategicsteps.ca to get started. Mayor, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciated. I want to start at the beginning, if you don't mind, by asking you a simple question that I've asked every single person who's ever come on this show, so you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from? Well, I I moved to Caslow from another small neighboring community in uh, a long time ago, 1979, and uh, lived here for a year or so. And then uh, my husband and I, after we were married, we moved to Edmonton and spent three years there. And then when we started having kids, um, Edmonton was not the place to be raising them. So we came back home to the Kootenays and um, I just, you know, I love, I love the community of Caslow. And um, I started volunteering as soon as my oldest son was three, started with the daycare society, went on to Cubs and Scouts. I actually formed a scout troop, the Beaver Colony, because there wasn't one and went through minor hockey and just about anything the kids were involved in, I I was involved in because there were not that many volunteers, but um, it's just, I, I just love my community and that was a way that I could give back. When did the volunteerism turn into desire for elected office? So I, I did a little bit of research and from what I gather, 2003, 2004 <laughs> ish, is when you first stand for your first election, correct? Uh, yes. 2000, I, 2005. It was, 2005 was when I started. The election was late 2004. Okay. And uh, so I had, uh, when my kids started getting, my youngest was, I think she was in grade six. And sort of went through the cycle of all the things the kids were involved with. And I still had, I still had time and wanted to continue to, to give back to my community. And I thought, you know, uh, running for a seat on council was the ne next logical step to me. Then I could give back to the entire community. So I ran in a by-election and was successful. Ooh. In your time in office, has the role of a municipal politician changed? I don't think the role has changed, but the way people perceive local government officials maybe has changed. Um, you know, they're gone through, I think, as the demographic of our community changes, because we've got uh, quite a a significant seniors population and they're far more engaged on a an in-person level and uh, younger people because there's more of them have to work outside the home like both the 
both both of the couple have to to be able to survive. Um, so their engagement is more on an online basis, um, the vir virtually and through social media. So it it has changed. It's not going to a coffee shop and and meeting with people. It's you know they'll send you emails mm. and that's how they want to engage because it it's at the time that works for them, which I do understand. Yeah. Has the has the, have the issues changed? Are you still dealing with the same issues and just in different areas, different contexts uh, that you were dealing with when you first were elected to now? Or do you see, and I often, and I hate painting broad strokes on this show, but I have to a little bit, um, the jurisdictional role of the municipality, you know what it does. I'm assuming your council knows what it does, but- yeah. I would say since the pandemic, and I hate to blame things on the pandemic, but I'm going to a little bit here for a second. Yeah. I, I, I would say that more and more people find that the municipal level of governance is the quickest and easiest to access. So people will come to their municipal leaders and ask about provincial issues or even federal. Do you find yourself in 2024 dealing with more issues that are not in the jurisdiction of the municipality than you were when you first got elected? I would say so, yes, because like you said, uh, the municipal government is the closest government to the people. So they will look to the people that they know and the ones that can be more responsive um, to requests. So we end up we end up dealing with things that are are more in the realm of a provincial uh, politician than than a municipal one. And. And sometimes we as politicians do and communities do voluntarily take that downloading because that's what our citizens want us to do. They want us to address those issues and we do the best we can. But, you know, it, hopefully it comes with funding from from other orders of government. But it doesn't uh, always. <laughs> I was going to say, not always happens when yeah. uh, you're you're dealing with issues that are not in your purview. Um in your time in office, you've probably come to the realization that you have to go into that council meetings with an open mind and an open yes. idea of how things are going to play out. While we do all have our unconscious biases on decisions that we're going to potentially make, how important is it for you to go into those council meetings prepared on the issues that you have to vote for, but not ingrained on the issues that you want to vote for because something may come up, someone may give a delegation or even one of your fellow councillors may say something that sparks a different way of thinking. Um, I would agree that is true. You, I think it's incumbent on politicians to come to the table with an open mind. Otherwise, you're not doing your job. And you do is it need easy? to do your research. It's not always easy, um, but, you know, you do have to be open um, because we do have, as you said, there is um, members of the public who will provide information and other council members. Um, you know, I've been very lucky with the councils that I've had. We've come from um, different uh, segments of the population, de different demographics for the most part. So bring different perspectives to the table that you might that I might not consider when going into a meeting. You know, you rely on staff to to give you the reports based on the information that they can can get ahead of time. And sometimes you you do have to change your mind because somebody brings something forward that you had not considered. And sometimes you will make a decision at the table right then, or if you feel something that was raised needs more investigation by staff. You've got to give them time to do that so you're making the best decision that you can with all of what you hope is all of the information and not be afraid to go back on on a resolution. Just because you've made it, it doesn't mean you can't back up and say, okay, we've got more information and we've got to reconsider this. Okay, I, I agree with that. 
But <laughs> there's a part that you didn't talk about that I want to sort of dive into a little bit because it's it's true. The recommendation comes from administration, it comes from staff. They are the yeah. ones who write reports and put put it at your table yeah. in the agenda. But you, at the end of the day, have to make that vote. That recommendation is just a recommendation. That's but right. the role of a municipal leader is to also engage with its residents and talk to yes. them about the issues. Uh, we talked about the jurisdictional issues a few seconds ago, but I want to dive into the engagement of residents. I have noticed in the last few years, there's not that many people who will show up to a council meeting anymore compared to 10, 15, even probably about 20 yes. years ago, it was packed. When you go out and ask people their opinion on issues that are facing the community, are they willing are they willing to give you their unbiased, unfiltered opinion? Um, yes, and I don't think we've ever got, gone through a phase where we've always had the room packed. There's always been just a very few and the room gets packed when it's a really hot button issue and you know, people maybe don't really have an understanding of what what it is you're dealing with and what the role of local government is in in regard to a certain issue. Sometimes they think that you can do certain things that the local government act or the community charter says you cannot do, um, that it's not within your purview to make a decision based on that information. Um, so that's when they will will come to you and then there has to be that back and forth. And, you know, we've had a few issues recently where there has been quite a bit of engagement and which is great. We always love it when, when we have members of the public, you know, we do have virtual option for all of our meetings. Now um, they can participate by zoom. So sometimes that's how they will participate. And we allow time for questions at each of our meetings so the public can ask a question before we go into the business part of the meeting and uh, make decisions. Because sometimes you will get a question that sparks conversation around the table and, and gives us thoughts that we didn't have in advance. Is it important for the municipal leaders like yourself and even your councils, but you in particular, to listen to both sides of the issue? Because... We, we all find ourselves in those echo chambers of social media or even in our own friends group who might agree with you wholeheartedly. But how important is it for you to listen to both sides and try to find people who may have an issue with the, the, is, that, the issues that are in front of the city or the village, I should say, to ensure that you're not just getting that one side perspective and you're getting all sides? You do have to, and lots of times as a member of council, you have to recognize that you're not just um, addressing, it, dealing with the issue based on who's written, brought it to your table because they they have, they do have certain biases as well. They want a certain outcome. So that's the information that they will provide you with. But there is that, we know there's that silent majority sometimes that um, we also have to represent. And that's where the different uh, members of council will talk to people in their, in their circles and get their opinions on things. Or they will, we've actually had quite a few people writing letters on things recently, which has been, been great. So, um, but you do have to sometimes meet them where they are where they are and and get their input. Okay. <laughs> where where do you find people most often? And and I'm not trying to be rude about that question is because social media is great. And I, I'm the first to admit that it's a double-edged sword. It can be a very toxic place, but it can also be a great place for municipal leaders like yourself or politicians across this great country to be able to engage with its residents. Where do you, where are you finding more and more people willing to have those conversations? Because 10 years ago, I could probably imagine that it was hard to go into a grocery store and go grab a carton of milk or a bag of milk and then run out 10 minutes later and say, okay, I need to be home. But now you're going into a grocery store. It's probably going to take about a half hour, 45 minutes because someone knows who you are. Do you still find that those grocery store conversations are important to your day-to-day -day decision-making process? 
I do because I, outside of being uh, being uh, the mayor, I do have a full time job. So I have always in all of my volunteer activities and in my council activities have set um, set boundaries. Don't call me before eight in the morning. Don't call me after nine um, because my husband worked um, and would get up at three in the morning. I didn't want the phone ringing at odd hours and waking him up. So people respect that. And I also don't want people coming to me in my place of work um, with council related questions because that's not what I'm being paid to do at that time. But when I'm out in the grocery store, I tell them I'm fair game. <laughs> that that is my that is the time that I am available to you. If you're seeing me in a in a public setting, I am I am available to you as the mayor. And if I don't have time, I will let them know and we'll we can follow up. So people, you know, our community, they're very respectful. And as far as social media, I don't engage in dialogue. I will look at social media to get the tone of what, you know, where things are going on certain issues and and consider that because quite often there is a good dialogue that happens, but I am only one member of council. So I am not, unless it's something that council has resolved to do or a certain message that's we've decided to put out, I'm not going to put out my opinion because I'm always looked at as mayor, never me as an individual. Once you're an elected official, you're always going to be seen as an elected official. That's my view anyway. So I do not engage. If I can provide something that's a fact um, and somebody's going down a wrong path with a wrong assumption about an issue, I will I will post something that is factual. This is what we passed at a meeting, or this is the bylaw, um, and then usually that stops conversation because then they've been presented with something that is factual and it's not. It goes beyond the speculation. Well, I think that this is what's happening. Okay. How often do you find yourself? Okay, understandable that the, the <laughs> private and personal life of a municipal leader is quite thin. Like when you step outside your house, even if you're going to your work, you're still the mayor of your community. You're still yeah. a representative to the region as well, because we haven't even gotten yeah. to that part yet. But yeah. you go out and you were the mayor of the community, no matter if you're at your day job or even yeah. just going to the gro a grocery store or even to a small restaurant or just running into a business. Do you find that people will respect those boundaries and say, okay, I'm at my job here. Here's my business card. Call me in a few hours and we'll have this discussion. Do you find that there is that respect? Because we're find I'm finding in my conversations that there is a blurring of the 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 need to have constant communications with their elected officials at a municipal level because you are the closest to the people. So they're probably more likely to know who you are than their MLA or even their MP. So do you find that there is that respect when it comes to that boundary that you need to set up as an elected official? Uh, yes, I do. Um, oh. Because really in the last, since I've been elected, it was elected and started to serve in 2005, I've actually only had about three people who've come into my place of work to ask me uh, address anything that's council related. And like I said, I even, you know, when I first started in volunteer work, I, I did set my boundaries and I think people respect that and that I will, I am willing to talk to them at the proper time and place. And, you know, when I say, this is not, I'm not being paid as mayor when I'm in this office. So, uh, yeah, people have been really, really great. I, I don't have any complaints in that way. And the ones that have approached me it here um, at my place of work, uh, and I've told them that, they totally understand. And we do follow up with a discussion afterwards. 
So I want to turn to the village as a whole for a second for the next few minutes. And I want to start by saying this, just want to preface this conversation a little bit before I ask the first question is, this is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not a policy of council. This is the mayor's opinion. It may line up with what's going on at council, but it's her opinion and her opinion alone. Mm -hmm. She has one vote on council. So, Mayor, in your opinion, what do you believe is the biggest challenge or challenges facing your village today in 2024 as of recording? Well, I think the primary one, which is shared with just about the entire country, is housing. Um, and it leads to a, a lot of other issues, but the the lack of attainable housing for people, uh, particularly our, our young people and our seniors. Um, so you seem to be frozen. <laughs> oh, no, I was just writing. I, I was writing. I apologize. Okay. Much. <laughs> all right. No, your but... screen is your screen is frozen, it seemed. But oh, all right, okay. I'll keep talking. So um yeah, it can boil down to housing because if people can't find housing, they're not going to be able to take a job in the service industry. So in a grocery store, in a in a restaurant, because they don't have a, a place that they can afford to live in order to take that job. So then our community vibrancy does get impacted because you go from being able to have, you know, we've had six or seven restaurants pre-COVID and they were staffed. And now we're down to three or four. So, and I think part of that is, is housing and the affordability factor. Um, so it does, yeah, one thing leads to another. There's a trickle down effect. But you realize that housing is not a strict municipal issue. It is not something that the municipality oh. itself can fix. You need contractors, you need the provincial government, you need the federal government to come help and solve these issues. What does the village do in the short term while waiting for those three other entities to come to the table to help solve the issue? Do you see yourself being able to navigate the housing issue in your community while trying to figure it out as from a strict municipal level? Um, well, there's not much we can, as a municipality of just over a thousand can do. We, you know, because whatever we do uh, financially impacts every resident in our community. And we already don't have a, a high median income. So people don't have a lot of money. So you're helping, you know, providing housing. We're trying to provide housing for one segment of the population, but then everybody is going to pay for it. We don't have um, sewer through the entire uh, village, which is a challenge. So any properties that we do own that aren't serviced, with sewer and water, that's a cost that potentially is borne by all taxpayers. Um, so we have always, for a long, long time, have had um, in our bylaws that um, carriage houses were allowed on a property if it was large enough that Interior Health would would give them a permit for um, a septic system. So we've had that for, for many years and we're just going through the process of updating the bylaws that we we can to meet the conditions of Bill 44. So that's, that's coming to tomorrow night's council meeting, actually, um, some of our revisions. So we've been trying to do what we can and we have a not-for-profit society in the village who just completed a housing project um, that was occupied last July. Um, so we worked with them to, they had a piece of property that the village had set aside. When I first started, there was a large parcel that was committed to a housing project and it hadn't, you know, hadn't gone anywhere for many years because of the servicing issue. And things really started to, to step up in the last three or four years. And we, we started to assist them with 
finding an alternate parcel of land that they might be able to use. They partnered with uh, an outfit out of um, Vancouver who they worked with and um, we were able to identify a parcel uh, which was municipally owned and it was in a serviced area. So we now have uh, 10 units of housing and um, we'll, I'm not sure where they're, they're at at this point because that's successfully running now and we'll, we'll see where it goes. So it can be done in a small community, but sometimes, you know, uh, municipal government moves at a snail's pace <laughs> what breaking the news here <laughs> <laughs> municipal government they run on a tight deadline um yeah okay so we've i forgot to mention the one aspect of the housing crisis the housing issue the housing uh, challenges that municipalities are facing and i want to ask about the residents because particularly in smaller communities People often move to those smaller villages, those towns, those city, the smaller rural urban communities because they're looking for a lifestyle. They're looking for an ability to get away from the hustle and bustle. How do you balance as mayor and council the desire to keep your community in a state where people want to be attracted to it for its vibrancy and its outdoor recreations? Because I, I've done a little research on your community and it seems like an outdoor man's paradise. How do you balance that aspect of your community with the desire that you want people to be able to stay in your community so you need to build houses? Because like every other community in this great country, there's probably there's some nimbyism around that saying, I don't want my community to change. I want it to stay exactly the way I moved into it. Well, there's there always has been and there always <laughs> will be that. You know, I've talked to people who don't, don't do that because it's going to change the way Caslow is. But if you can do it, you know, sometimes this slowness of municipal government is a good thing. Because then if you do it incrementally, people get used to the, the small changes that are made. Um, we do have a 30 unit uh, condo building across, I can see it out my, my window when I look out. Um, and that's been very successful. We do have to move forward. And as, as the demographic changes, we've had quite a few of our young people who have left um, our community are now coming back the same as as my husband and I we we moved away and realized that this is the place we want to be and so our kids of my children's age are doing the same thing and they're now buying businesses and operating them very successfully so there's always going to be that transition and we have to be open to it and support whatever it is that that helps people be able to live here and we cannot be the be looked to the, be the ones to provide all the housing options we can do what we can do uh through our bylaws to support that um but we can't be the ones to build the housing we just cannot afford it as a municipality do you get a sense that, or I shouldn't say, do you get a sense, but are people knocking on your door as the proverbial municipal door to try and build in your community? Or do you find that because of the economic challenges that Canada is facing right now, people aren't in the mood to build at this current point? You know, I, like I said, I've been on council for just about 20 years now, and we, because we're small and we are relatively remote, it's not a place where developers, larger developers are looking to come to, to build housing. Um, but smaller developers are like those one-off uh, housing units or those complexes that people want to build. They must be coming to you, right? Oh, we, yeah, we get people who are buying up, there's subdivisions that are done and there's, you know, one lot is split off. So somebody will buy that lot to build a home if they they have the means to do so. Again, that's always happened. And we do have quite a few people who will buy homes sort of on speculation. Like they've come through the community and or been here for jazz festival or for some other reason 
and they just fall in love with the community. So they want to get their home available to them for when they retire. And so then, you know, in two, three, four, five years, or even longer term than that, they're looking to, to locate here and they'll come for summers or long weekends and depending where they're coming from. So we do have quite a few homes that look very empty. <clears throat> they are they are owned and used on a, you know, not on a regular basis, but they, for all intents and purposes, they're they're empty for most of the year. That that's got to so, be a challenge, especially with the affordability and the the housing crisis that we have. When you see houses that are owned, which are respectfully owned and operated, and yep. technically owned by mm-hmm. someone, but sit empty while people are struggling. But that's that's yeah. Chris Brown saying that. That's not the mayor saying that. For yeah. those who are about to send emails, that's send them to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, the the more more of the impact is on our business community because if you don't have people living in those homes and supporting our business community year round, that that has a big impact on the livability of our community. We I look up and down the street right now, we rarely actually have a vacant storefront. We're quite lucky in that way. So we still have a, a vibrant downtown. I can't think of any of the stores that the storefronts that don't have something happening behind those doors. And maybe it'll be like with me, it's an office that you, there's, it's not something that you normally use, but there's something in there. There are people working in those spaces that, you know, they're, they're eating in the restaurants, they're, they're buying groceries, they're, they're getting gas. So um, they're supporting the community on a year round basis. So, housing comes with an affordability uh, sort of aura around it. And you talked about how housing challenges is sort of driven by the affordability uh, challenges as well. Um, Now you play a role in that aspect of the housing market because the decisions you make at that council table will impact the affordability of people being able to live, being able to work, being able to even go buy groceries on a weekly basis. How do you, and I say you as the royal you as council and you as yourself as mayor, balance the needs to grow the community, the needs to service the community with the needs that people are struggling and the understanding that the decisions you make at budget time or even when you send out those property tax notices are going to impact people. So you have to grow your community, but do it in a way that you're not impacting people. Ah. The the government, eh? <laughs> well, no, the, the municipal government is the last one to set their budget. Yeah. We, you know, the, the municipal government gets blamed for the entire tax bill, right? When I, I just got my tax, <laughs> my I just got my tax bill in, in the mail last week, and only a third of it is actually municipal taxation. So it's just over $100 per month on my personal tax bill that goes to municipal services. And then you've got your provincial, your uh, regional district taxes, because we have a number of services that are shared with with the regional district. And some of them are mandated by uh, the province. So for solid waste, that's a huge one. We share a fire service. Um, so those things are, they're necessary. And if we didn't have them, there would be, would be riots, <laughs> I think, because it, we do need it. There are so many things that we have to do. You know, you regularly get, you know, like I said, I watch Facebook and people will complain about things. I want this to happen, but it comes with the don't raise my taxes. Well, that doesn't happen, right? You have to be able to provide, you know, to provide the service people are asking for, it isn't free. Um, so we do have to, to look at that. And um, at this point uh, in 2024, the village of Castle will retire its last debt that it has. We've got no debt at all. Uh, which is 
really good. And but we've had a lot of things happen. We've been fortunate to get uh, get grants. Um, staff have worked very hard to to make things happen, and with the support of council and council has have brought things forward. And um, you know, we've got things for our community to do. We've got numerous parks. We've got a very vibrant not-for-profit society with, with the arts and we've got heritage assets in our community and a lot of recreational assets that are put to good use on a regular basis. And we've got so many things to do in Caslow that it's really hard to organize something new because you've got, you can't find a time to schedule it in because people's calendars are full. I want to, I want to, because I'm cautious of time, I want to flip the script a little bit for a second from the original challenges question. And from yeah. a governmental perspective, from a governmental and administration viewpoint, what's the thing that Caslo does good? What is the thing that you are proud of when it comes to your community's administration and municipal side? We'll talk about the actual community side in a few seconds, but from an administration side, what's the thing you boast about when you talk to people across uh, your community or even other municipal leaders? We do have an awesome staff at the village of Castle. Um, you know, they, they, they listen to the, um, to the council because, you know, it, it could be a good and bad thing that some of us have been on council for a long time. There is there is the history and, you know, history can be looked at both good and bad. But if something is raised and you've got the background on it and you could say this is what's happened in the past and this was the reaction. And that doesn't mean don't do it or don't look into it. It's just this is what has occurred before and they've been very good about doing that the the hardest thing is for them to say no to council and so, and sometimes i'll have to say to our administration don't be afraid to say no because you know we want to be successful as as a community and as a council and we we try to do as much as we can without it costing uh, a lot of money and that again where the slowness comes in sometimes we want to undertake projects but we will wait for there to be a grant that a program that's can ha help that happen rather than oh yeah we'll just go out and borrow the money and make it happen then you're paying for for years on it so we'll we'll get those grants and you know put in a bit of money towards it and and it it does happen. So uh, I I, I want to flip the line of questioning now and talk about my favorite subject because <laughs> in July for a week and a half I'm visiting most of the communities that have come on this show in southeastern British Columbia. So I'm coming to the village of Caslow in July. So I want to know what are some of the tourist destinations? What are some of the hidden gems that you wish people knew about that you say, if you come to the Kootenays, you need to stop in our community and visit this? No, I know you've done your research, but we do have, like you talked about, uh, our heritage assets. I think just about everybody knows or has heard about the SS Moye, the oldest intact sternwheeler in the world. And they've just undergone a significant renovation um, or restoration project and, and received a Heritage BC award for it, um, which the village nominated them for because they, they're just, yeah. Um, and then we've got the Langham Cultural Center, which is a museum art gallery, but it also was a former internment site and they have the Japanese Canadian Museum there. So that is, uh, I would say, one of the must-sees on the heritage front. And um, as I mentioned earlier, we've got a number of parks, the Castle Bay Park that um, where Jazz Fest happens on the August long weekend. Uh, we've got Vimy Park where there's all kinds, there's uh, baseball 
that happens and we had a, uh, the organization has done an immense number of improvements to it. It's got a red shale infield now and they just, it's been fantastic. The number of players has grown. Um, they, they crashed the system when they went for sign up. So they ended up with, I can't remember whether it's 10 or 12 teams or even more in the adult league. So it's seeing a resurgence because of their passion for, for baseball and wanting to have things for the kids to do and the adults to do. We've got pickleball. We've, we've got so many recreational opportunities that unless you're into that, the certain things, you don't hear about them, right? We've, we've got a, a little bike, kids bike park. We've got pickleball and tennis and uh, disc golf and so many trails that are maintained by our local um, trail organization. And, and it's all primarily due to volunteers. Um, the village doesn't have to put in a lot of money towards these things. We will give staff time in lieu if they need heavy equipment to do work, but generally there isn't a huge amount of cash that has to be put forward by the village because they're they're just so committed to their community. That sounds, that, you're painting a very vibrant picture and <laughs> I'm so yeah. looking forward to visiting. But where do you go? After a long day of council meetings, after a long day of working, is there a spot in your, the community that you can just go and decompress and go, okay, I need to recenter myself because tomorrow morning I'm going to be back at it trying to make my community a better place than I left it the day before? I go home. <laughs> the honest politician answer. I love it. <laughs> yeah. And it, well, I, I love to read. Um and that's what I do, but I, I watch what's considered fluff television, right? It's just something that lets me, me check out, but I don't, and I don't watch commercials. So I've always got my book. Um, so I'll, during commercials, I, I read my book and, and I, you know, I can multitask. I, I think I can multitask anyhow. Um, and, but I will, I, uh, Quite often, I will still be working. I'll have my kit, my laptop on my lap, and you know, I'll type my my mayor's report or whatever else I'm I'm working on. And it's just that's just what I do. I'm so I'm got, a meeting geek, actually. <laughs> I've got to ask not a municipal question, but I've because I'm a book lover. What's the last book you read? Um, right now I'm reading a Jeffrey Deaver book. And I read so much that <laughs> I will go to the library and I have to get four or five books because chances are I might have read a couple of them that I <laughs> picked up. So I've got to bring multiples. And if I get 10 pages in and I'll think, geez, I've already read this one. I better take pick up the next one. So and I've got an, I've got quite an extensive collection at home as well. Uh, so I'm trying not to do that as much. <laughs> <laughs> so my final question for you, Mayor Hewitt, and it's an important one. It's the million dollar question. We started by talking about you. We're ending by talking about yeah. Caslow. And I want to ask a very important question. I think every municipal leader knows how to answer, but let's put it on the record right here, right now. What makes your community such a great place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Well, um, I think first off, it is the people. I, I think that, you know, you come for the beauty, but once you get to know the people, they're, they're just so awesome. And you can be a relative new comfort, comer to town. And if you have something that's occurring in your life that is, you know, a medical issue or, you know, you've experienced a, a fire at your home and you've lost your belongings, the community will step up and support you. Um, it, it's as simple as that. It, it's the people we do have, you know, you can have beauty everywhere, but it's the beauty of the people that stand out for me. 
Well, I'm looking forward to meeting the people when I come out to Caslo in, in July. And I'm so looking forward because you painted a vibrant picture and I'm a big heritage uh, nerd. So I love visiting communities that are rooted deep in heritage and so many mm -hmm. museums and cultural icons. So I'm looking forward to visiting and actually seeing these items up close and personal. Um, I also want to say thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to do this. Uh, it's always a pleasure to sit down with municipal leaders across uh, Canada, but to particular British Columbia. I know you're going to be coming. I'm, I'm assuming I shouldn't. I shouldn't assume, but I, I, I you're standing for an election for FCM yes. uh, for the board of directors. So you'll probably be here in Calgary. So when we're you're in I Calgary. Know. Hopefully I'll be able to say hi to you and we can chat and say, have a little off the record conversation, but until Calgary and then in Caslo, thank you so much. Well, you're welcome, Chris. And it was very nice to meet you. Thanks for tuning in for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. If you've enjoyed today's episode, hit that subscribe button because you do not want to miss the range of interviews coming up in the later half of June and even possibly into July. If you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, but as always, just keep talking. Thank you.